Okay, we might um, get up underway. Um, welcome everybody to this week's Linguistics Department Seminar. Um, today we have uh, Dr. Rick Nauwen from Utrecht University. Um, and uh, Rick's area of specialization in um, linguistics is formal semantics um, and pragmatics. And he's <coughs> mostly um, worked in the area of um, interactions, intersections between philosophy of language, cognitive psychology, and uh, formal semantics and pragmatics. Um, he has an impressive uh, website. Oh, really? Oh. No one dot org, which, I, which <laughs> I was very impressed to have a look at. Very long list of papers and uh, journal and <coughs> articles and books that um, he's published. And in addition to that, he's also editor of the Journal of Semantics, uh, one of the top class journals in the field of linguistics. So uh, we're very fortunate to have him here today to talk to us about modified numerals. So thank you very much for the invitation and the nice introduction and uh, um, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very curious what you think of my work. I, I, I've just heard you don't see formal semanticists that, of, that often so uh, I'm curious to see what you think of my work. I've heard that the acoustics are slightly weird here because of the, so whenever you can't hear me anymore just uh, raise a hand or well, just raising a hand is probably not very helpful, just say louder or something like that. I prefer not to use the microphone, but if I have to, I'll, I'll do it. Um, so this is a talk about um, modified numerals, and what I decided to do is I'm going to give you an overview of sort of, I'm going to give you my view of the past 10 years of research into the field of modified numerals. And my main goal is to show you what is interesting about them. Yeah. So because it's of course a very specific uh, uh, topic, um, but I think especially if you're interested in uh, the relation between um, 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 meaning and form and, and use of meanings, then um, modified numerals is maybe a nice place to look, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you uh, why. Uh, I've also kept the formal semantics to an absolute minimum. Uh, if you want more details, just let me know, and I'll tell you uh, what's under the hood. Uh, okay, so here's um, what this is about. So this is about expressions of quantity, um, so we've got words for numbers, numerals, uh, and we also have expressions for relations between numbers. Uh, these are the kind of things that I want to look at. Uh, we call them modified numerals. So these are things like more than 10, fewer than 10, at least 10, at most 10. Uh, and our intuition is that this somehow relates to these kinds of Arithmetic, arithmetic uh, relations, so more than 10 means that the number you're talking about is strictly greater than 10, right? So in, at first glance, it's completely um, not obvious why you would want to look at the semantics of these things because the semantics seems so incredibly simple, yeah? So there just seems to be something about uh, you have 10 and then you've got everything that's more than 10, okay? Um, now what we'll see later is that actually if you look at the deeper semantics of these things, these things are very uh, uh, mysterious. Uh, but before I go on, um, one thing. So I call them modified numerals um, and I call these guys things like more than and things like at least modifiers. Uh, but uh, bear in mind that I don't mean the term, I don't use the term modifier in any technical way. Yeah? So they might not be modifiers. Uh, it's just a handy catch all phrase for these kind of things. Yeah? So these guys are probably modifiers. Um, there are some arguments that say that these guys aren't strictly speaking modifiers, but you know, I'll call all of these modifiers. So why do we want to study modified numerals? Um, well, one reason is that the, uh, the lexical forms that we use to modify numerals come in a great variety. So you see, the, here's the, the picture from English. Um, you can say more than 10, you also have things like over 10, from 10, at least 10, 10 or more, minimally 10. And if you want to talk about upper bounds, you have the similar st uh, stuff uh, over here. Um, 
But what is strange is that this variety of ways of expressing things really still expresses these four relations, right? So either an inclusive or an exclusive um, uh, uh, comparison between numbers. Um, so there, there really is, um, um, so these simple relations really go with quite a strange variety of, uh, of expressions. And if you look a bit closer at, uh, at what these expressions look like, you see that there really is no dedicated morphology for these things, right? So what we really do when we modify numeral is um, we borrow from other domains of the grammar. So we use comparatives or uh, prepositions or superlatives or disjunctions, right? Or we use these kinds of um, um, adverbs that you use uh, in other uh, areas too. Um, now, the idea is that if you s that modified numerals, you can use modified numerals now to really study what happens when you use lexical material from other domains in this very narrow domain of numerals, right? So what happens? So we know, we know a lot about comparatives. What happens if you take comparative morphology and the meaning of comparative morphology and suddenly start using it uh, with, with numbers? Yeah? And the same with the superlative, the same with uh, prepositions, etc. So this is the plan. So the first of all, I'm going to zoom in on the lexical form of these things. Um, so why do we see this borrowed vocabulary for modified numeral forms? Um, and in particular, I'm going to zoom in on spatial numerals. So things like over 10, up to 10, under 10, uh, from 10. Yeah? So the question is, why do we use these uh, prepositions here to talk about numerals? Right? Prepositions talk about space. Right? And, and what happens if you, if you use a form that normally talks about space to now talk about uh, quantity? Um, and then in the second part, I'll say a little bit about the meaning of these things. And there will be an interesting connection between these two parts. So what is actually the meaning of something like over 10 or under 100? Yeah? Um, and we'll see that, uh, that um, um, the lexical form really matters here, that, that you, can actually see, you can actually find, so for instance, the difference between comparative and superlative morphology really matters to the semantics of a modified numeral. That's going to be one of the claims that I'll make. Okay. Um, so here's part one, so the form of modified numerals. This, this took me uh, 10 seconds to Google. I wanted to find a, a sentence that had psoas in it and that had a modified numeral with over in it, and, and really this was the second hit. Um, psoas has over 115 postgraduate programs taught on campus. Uh, everybody knows what this means, right? Why is there a spatial preposition here? That's the, uh, uh, that's the question now. Um, and we can, we can think about this a little bit more abstractly. What would it mean to compare thinking about numbers to thinking about space? Yeah? Okay. And here's where we should start now. Um, so does anybody know what this is? Oh, this is good. No, nobody knows about this. It's really nice. I like this. Um, so <laughs> I'm always fear that everyone's going, oh, yeah, that's a number form. This is a number form. And number forms, uh, the, the concept of number forms appeared in two publications by Francis Galton in the 19th century. Um, and he described them as follows. Uh, a number form is that this peculiarity consists in the sudden and automatic appearance of a vivid and invariable form in the mental field of view whenever a numeral is thought of and in which each numeral has its own definite place. Yeah? Does, does, do people get a feeling what this is already? So the idea is that when you think of a number, you see something in your mental, in your mental view. Right? So you see the numbers in a certain shape. So when you think about the number 20, you see them in relation to the nearby numbers, say 10 and 30, but 10 is somewhere here and 30 is somewhere there, or 10 is somewhere here and 30 is somewhere there. You give these numbers a, a, a location and space when you think about them. So what Golden did is he, he interviewed his friends and he asked them, do you have this? Have you got, have you got 
some spatial ideas about the numbers that you think about. And so in these interviews, things like this came up. The, so this is his friend TM. Uh, the representation I carry in my mind of the numerical series is quite distinct to me, so much so that I cannot think of any number, but I at once see it, as it were, in its peculiar place in the diagram. Um, so these diagrams, they come in, in various forms, right? So that everybody has his own number form, right? Everybody who has a number form has his own or her own uh, number form. And some are quite exotic like this one, and some are even more exotic like, like this one, for instance, where it's not just a two-dimensional shape, it's actually a three-dimensional three shape. So the person is sort of looking up towards the numbers and then they sort of go, 100 is quite far away and to the right, and you see 12 is to the left. Uh, what is very common is that um, you know, there's like very obvious spatial features that the direction changes around 10 and it changes around 100, right? And it might even change around 12 again, or right, so, so something like that, right? So there's there are some some there are there are some things that are quite common to all of these things, but they're they're as becomes clear from this picture, they're also strikingly different. Yeah? Um, so number forms really is a type of synesthesia. Um, it's quite common though; it's 12 percent, right? So this this is uh, data that is quite uh, recent. Um, does anybody recognize this? Does anybody have this? So th keep up, you have it? Yeah. Yeah. Keep on, th keep on thinking about it. Most people don't realize they have it. And next week you might suddenly find your number form. So this is really something that you have. You have it, it's conscious, but you might not be aware of it. So, so it's, it's not subconscious, but you might simply not realize that you're doing it. And sometimes you might be doing it uh, only when you think about numbers in a certain context. For instance, when you think of the days of the month or the days of the week. Right? So for most people, when they think of the days of the week, they think of a circle. Right? Or when they think of the year, they think of a circle. Right? So, the, the, so there, there's, there's an obvious way in which, if you have this, uh, you might give a different shape to these kinds of number forms in different contexts. OK. Um, so, um, so people who have this, I've said this, can become aware of it. Um, um, now, what, 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 what is this? What do we do with this? Um, well, the, the answer is not very much, right? So what does this suggest? It suggests that there can be a cognitive relation between number and space, yeah? Um, but this relation seems to be incredibly unsystematic, yeah? We can't really say anything about it because for some people 100 is over there and for other people it's over there. I mean, what are we going to study then, right? Okay. Um, so number forms are interesting to start a talk with, but that's about it. Yeah? Okay, so let's look at something that might uh, tell us a little bit more about the relation between space and quantity. Um, this is the SNARC with a C. Um, a SNARC stands for Spatial Numerical Association of Response Codes, and it was uh, uh, studied extensively in the 90s by uh, Stanislas de Haan, a French uh, a cognitive psychologist. Um, and what he did was this. Um, so he, he had a fairly uh, simple experiment. So the experiment was like this. You have a computer screen in front of you, and in the middle of the computer screen, you're going to see a number between 1 and 9. Or 0. No, 0 and 9. It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, and you know that the number will be between 0 and 9. OK? Uh, you've got two buttons. Um, and all you have to do is decide whether the number is <coughs> odd or even. Yeah? If it's odd, you press left. If it's even, you press right. Yeah? There's another group which has the same task, but with the button switched. Right? So odd is then right, and even is left. Yeah? Um, now what happens is that if you see a 3 in the middle of your screen, uh, 3 is odd, yeah? then you're quicker if this is your response rule, if you have to press with the left button. Uh, if you see a 7, which is also odd, then you're quicker with the second uh, response rule when you have to press the right button. Now, the interpretation of this is as follows. You know you're going to see a number between 0 and 9. 
And you picture this as a line with the zero on your left hand side and with the nine on your right hand side. Yeah? And so when you see that seven, you have a bias towards the right. And when you see that uh, uh, three, you have a bias towards the left. Yeah? Okay. Um, this has been replicated um, many times. Um, but there's something very interesting about it. Um, there's clear evidence that the snark is actually influenced by reading systems. Yeah? So if you, this works if you read from left to right. If you read from right to left, you also have a snark. Also, you have a similar effect, but it's the other way around. If you read from top to bottom, you'll have a vertical snark. Yeah? So this relation between um, quantity and space is one that is really that really has to do with how we're used how we're used to ordering things in space right so when you when you teach your child how to count from 0 to 10 you you buy them one of those toys with maybe one of those puzzles right where you have puzzle pieces and what the child will see is really that the one is on the left and the nine is on the right right so that's what that's at least at least if you read from left to right yeah? so that's it, it, it basically is an effect not really of um, uh, of quantity, but it's an effect of ordering, yeah. And that ordering is is culturally uh, uh, influenced. Um, now, so what we've seen is that there is some cognitive interaction between number and space, but it doesn't really. It's not very hopeful that we're going to find anything linguistically interesting here. Um, because we haven't found any linguistic influence yet, right? All that we found is that uh, that how you use to ordering things influences things, and you might have this vague number form, right? That that that's the way you picture numbers. Um, but so far, no link to language. So let's now have a look at language. Um, and then we have to talk about uh, metaphors, um, and in particular, we. T the, the only really uh, serious work I know about this is, is the, I think, famous Lakoff and Johnson book about metaphor. And they propose um, the metaphor of the heap, not to be confused with the paradox of the heap, which is something completely different. Um, and the metaphor of the heap is um, a way of thinking about how we talk of, about quantity. And the idea is. Uh, is as follows. When we talk about quantity, we conceptualize quantity as a pile of stuff. And if there's more stuff, then the pile will become bigger. In particular, it will become higher. Yeah? So what we're interested in when we talk about stuff, the, the quantity of stuff, is how high is the pile? That's the metaphor. right? So when we talk about quantity, we talk about a vertical axis. Yeah? So this is already, you see, there is something different going on here. Because uh, at least for, 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 uh, for somebody like me, who is used to reading from left to right, uh, I, I have this snark effect that is horizontal. Yeah? So what Lakoff and Johnson, uh, Johnson say, when you talk about quantity it, using natural language, you will do this vertically. Yeah? And here's some uh, evidence of what this looks like. Um, so this is the kind of thing they're looking at. Um, when, you're, when you're talking about how high your income is, uh, you, did you hear what I said? How high your income is, right? You say your income rises, right? Your, my income rose, right? So the idea is that it goes up. Yeah? And so I, I've already used three metaphors, right? I said, how high is it? It goes up, it's rising, right? So when we talk about quantity, we immediately talk about a vertical axis, yeah? right? We can say the number of arrows he made is low, he's under age, right? So there's a preposition here that's also vertical, right? Uh, his blood pressure is high, uh, he turned the heat down, yeah? So all these expressions basically have to do with if, if you simply abstract away of what the sentence says and you look, and you, says, and you look at the, um, the relevant um, uh, prepositions here and the relevant adjectives here, they, they really have to do with a vertical axis. Yeah? And, and, and we're so used to using these things that we don't see them uh, uh, anymore. 
OK, now modified numerals. Um, it, modified numerals, you see exactly the same thing. Right? So you can say under 100 pages. You can say up to 100 pages. But you can't say next to 100 pages or in front of 100 pages or behind 100 pages. All the expressions that you use to combine with a numeral, if they have a spatial character, that spatial character will have to do something with a vertical axis. Yeah? So that, that's the idea. That's the idea that, that when we look at um, um, when we look at anything in language that has to do with quantity and space, then we'll see verticality. Um, now, there's a paper in Lingua that that um, that looks at this, especially in Dutch and and, some of, and quite a few other languages too, um, by Corvo and Zwarts. And they say uh, the number scale is metaphorically related to verticality. We find vertical prepositions like above, below in prepositional numerals, but not horizontal prepositions like in front of or next. Dynamic prepositions like over and against lose their motion sense and keep only the ordering sense and proximity sense respectively. The important thing is that the lexical semantics of numerical prepositions is very close to their spatial sources. And this is going to be the um, intuition that we're going to need for the rest of the talk. So this final sentence says, the lexical semantics of these prepositions is very close to their spatial source. So what these authors actually suggest is that when you use a preposition and you combine it with a numeral, so you use something that you really use to talk about space, and suddenly you start using it to talk about quantity, really, you're not really changing that much to the meaning. You're really still using that spatial meaning, even in the quantity domain. And that's so we're not changing the preposition. We're changing our conceptualiza conceptualization of quantity in into something that resembles space. Yeah, so, so it's really that we're reforming the, the, our way of thinking about quantity instead of our way of thinking about prepositions. Um, just a few notes before I show what this looks like. Um, there are some seemingly counterexamples uh, of this verticality hypothesis. Um, but I don't think they're very uh, severe. So in American English, you can say things like he's earning north of $50,000. Uh, I've been told. Um, you, in a way, this is still vertical, right? Because the north, we, we think of the north-south axis as something that's vertical. Vertical. You won't find, so here's my hypothesis, you f won't find a language that will say he's earning east of uh, $50,000. Yeah? I mean, correct me if I would be very interested to hear if you know of a language that says this. Um, also, you could think about things like he, he earns between $10,000 and $20,000. Is this vertical? Um, well, at least it's compatible with a vertical axis, right? So I'm standing between the floor and the ceiling. Right? Well, yeah, it's yeah. between the floor and the park. Yeah. <laughs> The, the sausage is between the two sides of the bun, right? The two bits of the bun, right? So there, there is something, right? You can turn these things into vertical things. Uh, same with a round, right? So of course, a round has, has a horizontal, horizontal use, but it also has a vertical use. Yeah? So that, that's the main thing. There are, there are these kinds of examples that you see in not many languages, but in some where you, where, where you sometimes see that you have uh, things like left and right to talk about these kinds of uh, uh, proximal things. So he earns left, left right of uh, $50,000. Yeah, there are quite a few languages that do that. I, d I don't know where to place these, because there's no way that that is vertical. Right? So that's, uh, it's usually these proximal things that are quite difficult to put into this vertical hypothesis. So I'm, I'm honest, this is not a completely uh, watertight uh, generalization, but it seems to be quite general. OK, so the conclusion here is um, um, number is metaphorically conceptualized vertically. And this is why spatial prepositions can modify numerals, right? Because we can think of quantity in a spatial way. Yeah. Um, but they can only do this if they are uh, compatible with vertical or, uh, orientation. So here's the idea then. Um, 
this is my the only slide with formal semantics in it. Okay, so uh, the cat is under the table. Yeah, it's true if and only if, right? The location of the cat is under the table, right? And there's a formula behind this, but right, you, you can decide whether this is true or false, right? Simply by checking whether the cat is indeed under the table. Um, now, if I have a sentence like this, Chatham has under 300 residents, all I have to do is the table becomes 300 and the cat becomes uh, the number of, uh, of residents of Chatham, which is 273. Um, and then what you need to do is you need to check whether the cat is under the table. Yeah, and then the sentence, right? So in, in principle, we don't have to change the semantics of the preposition. Uh, the only thing we have to do is we have to find the right representation of quantity. Yeah, OK. OK, so. Um, now for the catch, OK. Um, so what I think this shows is some sort of plasticity of lexical semantics, so that you can just take the semantics in one domain and apply it in a different <coughs> domain, as long as that different domain has, uh, has the same kind of features, or at least can be made to have the same kind of features. Yeah? So the idea is that the domain of quantity and the domain of space have enough in common for, for you to use locative prepositions uh, in both domains. Um, and so at the heart of this is some kind of metaphorical uh, mechanism. Bear in mind, uh, a formal semanticist like me doesn't know what to do with metaphorical uh, mechanisms, right? So we simply have to assume that these things are somehow in place. We, we don't really know how to model them correctly, right? Um, Lakoff and Johnson are not formal semanticists, uh, needless to say, right? Um, okay, so, um, so he, but here's what this picture looks like, the third bullet point. So the linguistic link between space and number appears to be limited to the verticality of the spatial representation. But then you start to wonder, what about other aspects of spatial representation, right? About prepositions. In particular, one salient feature of prepositions, of spatial prepositions, is that there's a distinction between locative and directional uh, prepositions, or sometimes called dynamic. I call them directional because uh, that's how I grew up. So here's that distinction. Um, a locative preposition uh, expresses the location of the subject. Uh, this is a, a Mickey Mouse uh, overview of the difference between locative and directional prepositions. It's, uh, uh, as ma many of you probably know, uh, a lot more complicated than this, but uh, I just want to make a main point. Uh, so a locative preposition talks about uh, a location. So the cat is on the mat, the cat is behind the house, the cat is under the table. Um, a directional preposition expresses the path that describes the motion of a subject. So a directional preposition uh, is really meant to express motion, not location. Yeah? Um, um, and so these kinds of prepositions are incompatible with, uh, spatial re with locative spatial relations. So that's why you can't say something like the cat is to the mat or the cat is up to the house or the car was parked from the house to the church. Yeah, well, the, only, the only way you can read this is if, it, if it's a very long car, right? So you, immediately you, you, you start thinking of something, um, it has something that, 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 that is a path, right? OK. Um, so what you need to do, you need to uh, bring in an element of motion, like the cat walks to the mat, the cat was carried up to the house, uh, the cat drove from the house to the church. It should probably be car, but uh, that's clear. The, the cat drove from the house to the church. Yeah? Okay. Um, so this is an interesting, quite uh, obvious uh, feature of, of uh, prepositions. And if, if we go back to the Corver and Swartz paper, they actually suggest that um, uh, um, that this distinction disappears whenever you look at modified numerals. Um, and, and one of the reasons that they did this was because they looked at something like over in English, like over 100. Um, 
And they, well, so over has two senses in English. You can fly over a bridge, which is directional, and a cloud can hang over uh, something or somebody, right? Um, and so this, this second sense really is locative. Uh, and that's also the real vert vertical um, uh, uh, sense of, of over, right? The, the flying over the bridge is sort of quite, is, is actually sort of horizontal, right? So there has to be something under it, but the main direction is horizontal. Um, so they said, well, over is, is maybe just simply uh, evidence that directionality has nothing to do with uh, modified numerals, right? So, and if you have this number line, you know, with Chatham with 300 and 273, that's clearly just a very static uh, two dimensional representation. There's no place there, you would think, for uh, motion. Okay, so here's, uh, here's something we could try. Um, if uh, this is a very strange, thing. if for if for this is a garden path, I think. If what matters for modified numerals, if all that matters for modified numerals is verticality, if if you only need verticality to talk about modified numerals, then up to and under should sort of be similar to each other, right? So up to is sort of the the directional version of under, yeah. Uh, in the numerical domain. Um, but it actually appears that this isn't the case. So let's have a look at this. Um, so this is a little bit of reasoning that you can do. Uh, so formal semantics do that, right? So Chatham is 273, Chatham has 273 inhabitants, and so Chatham has under 300 inhabitants. That's a valid bit of reasoning. I hope you all agree. <coughs> um, but what about this one? Um, Chatham has 273 inhabitants, and so Chatham has up to 300 inhabitants. Anybody think that this is good? Okay, so, so good. <laughs> you might not think it's totally bad, right? But, there's, but I hope that most of you will see that there is, there's, so, there's something going on here. This one is clearly less happy than this one, right? So let's not give it a number or a name. Uh, but there's something going on here. Here's another contrast that I want to uh, try out on you. Um, when I looked up the exact number of followers I have on Twitter, it turned out I still have under a thousand followers. Versus when I looked up the exact number of followers I have on Twitter, it turned out I still have up to a thousand followers. <coughs> Now, this one might be. This one is a bit strange. If you think that this one isn't strange, I hope you also. That then I hope that you agree that this one means something different from this one. Yeah, and we'll we'll have some crisper things later. These these examples are teasers for you to see that um, it's what you can't do once you start thinking about spatial prepositions combining with numerals. You can't just think I take the spatial preposition. I bash it until it's locative. I take all the motion out of it. I just take the verticality. I also ignore anything else that's going. So locative, vertical, that's all I'm interested in. And then I have my semantics that I will apply in the numerical domain. Yeah? That's probably not going to happen. OK. Um, yeah. Um, so this means that we need to have a, uh, th this is my in this is my bridge to the to the uh, semantic part of the talk. This really means that we now need to have a look at the proper semantics of these things. So what do these things really mean? Um, so what we've seen is that up to a certain extent there's plasticity of lexical meaning. Um, so apart from orientation, it might be that also the dynamics of a preposition can interact with numerical scales. But it, it's not immediately clear what that would be and what that would mean, right? So this is the so the next part is really the semantics. What does it mean? So what could it mean that a spatial preposition has a directional meaning in the numerical domain? Okay. Um, so what is the semantics of more than n a b? So more than ten students pass the exam. Right, that's a, um, well, here is what you would find, uh, say, 20 years ago. More than n a b is true if and only if the number of a that b exceeds n. Yeah, so very simple semantics, right? So you look at 
those entities that have both these properties, you count them and it has to be higher than n. Yeah? Okay. With at least you do exactly the same, but you have an inclusive relation. Yeah, so um, at least n a b is true if and only if the number of a that b is n or higher. Okay. Um, and so that means that uh, this is sort of your semantics then for all these expressions. They simply mean these kinds of relations. Yeah. Okay. So they simply talk about either inclusive or exclusive relations to a number, and either upwards or downwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, now here's a prediction. Um, um, the prediction is something like this: that more than the meaning of more than three is equivalent to the meaning of at least four, and the meaning of fewer than ten is equivalent to the meaning of at most nine. This is if you uh, if you only if you talk about count nouns. If you, so, if you talk about kilograms or if you talk about uh, average children, then it, this doesn't work. But um, um, if we just talk about the number of students that pass the exam, then this should work. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, what we so we we doubted this quite a few years ago, uh, Bart Hertz and me, uh, in uh, in a paper uh, from 2007. And we did a very simple experiment. So um, this was, again, one of those reasoning experiments. Um, so we gave people a premise, like Beryl had three sherries. And then we asked them whether, not, not all four of them at the same time, but we asked subjects whether these sentences followed. So does it follow from Beryl had three sherries that Beryl had more than two sherries? Uh, and yeah, 100% said yes. Does it follow that, fewer than, that she had fewer than five sherries? 92% uh, uh, yes. It, up to this day, it's, it's, it's a, we really have no clue what happened to those 8%. But uh, uh, I, I propose to ignore it for now. Um, the interesting uh, stuff happens here. Did Beryl have at most four sherries? Uh, and people are very reluctant to accept this. Did Beryl have at least uh, three sherries? Um, they get sort of chance level response. Well, it should be clear that these superlative forms behave completely different from these comparative forms, right? So, and you might have the same intuition if you were a subject in this uh, simple experiment. Um, so this um, clearly. Um, it, it makes you doubt this uh, hypothesis that these superlative and these comparative modified numerals are somehow equivalent semantically, right? Because when you use them in an experiment, they give completely different results. And you can get intuitions that might uh, inform this too. Um, I have more than one child. Um, that's true if I say it. Yeah. Uh, what happens if I say I have at least two children? Uh, so. It suggests that, uh, do you get it? So I'm a rock star, right? Or, 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 or a sperm donor, one, one of the two, right? But I'm, I, I'm, I'm not quite capable of deciding how many children I have then, right? So, and that's quite strange, because most of us, I would presume, know how many children we have. Um, so I have two children, but yeah, I, it would be very strange to say this, right? It would be okay for me to say I have more than one child, but it would be strange for me to say that I have at least two children. Um, so here's one way to describe this, and this is to use the term ignorance. Um, so comparative modified numerals, so more than, fewer than, less than, um, are compatible with speaker ignorance. Um, but superlative mo modified numerals really require it. Yeah? Of course, you could say, I have more than one child if you don't know how many children you have. But if, but if you say, I have at least two children, you really need to not know how many children you have. You need to be <coughs> ignorant about these things. Here's another way of showing this. I know exactly how much memory my laptop has, and it's more than two gigabytes. Uh, that seems to be fine, um, but something like, I know exactly how much memory my laptop has, and it's more than two gigabytes. Wait a minute, that's, that's, that, that should be at least, right? This is, OK, so this should be at least, right? I know exactly how much memory my laptop has, and it's at least two gigabytes. It almost sounds like I make you guess how much it is, right? So that I, I want, want you to remain ignorant. There's some level of ignorance here. Sorry for the typo. Um, 
But it's not just ignorance, there are other effects as well. So a triangle has fewer than 10 sides, is fine, but a triangle has at most nine sides. Who, who finds this acceptable? I should maybe just get rid of all the... Nobody finds this acceptable. I, so I did this talk uh, in front of a, uh, an audience of logicians. Everybody found it fine, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so it, it really matters in which, in what kind of st uh, frame of mind you are. But it, it, I, I think the intuition here with the second sentence is either you don't know how many sides a triangle has, which is strange, right? Or you think, and this is even stranger, that there are different kinds of triangles and the kind with the most number of sides has nine sides, right? <laughs> Which is uh, even stranger, yeah? Okay. Uh, I have an example later where this actually works. I should have had it here, but I'll, I'll show it to you later. Um, so, but not, so not everything might be ignorance, and here you see it even clearer. So my laptop has at least two gigabytes of memory. It might suggest that I don't know how much memory my laptop has. But if I'm a salesperson, uh, you come into the shop and I, say, I tell you the laptops we sell all have at least two gigabytes of memory. Now, either you're suggesting that this is a bad salesperson, right, who doesn't know how much memory there is in the laptops, but the more likely reading is this. Uh, this shop doesn't sell laptops with fewer than two gigabytes of memory. Right? So here, there's, there's not necessarily an ignorance stuff going on. Right? Um, so, ha so here's another one. Um, John has accumulated at least 110 ECTs um, versus John is required to accumulate at least 120 ECTs. So here you're saying, I don't know how many he has, but it's more than 110. And here you're not saying, I don't know how many he has to have. No, here, here there's no ignorance. You're basically saying the rule is once you have 120 credits, you're fine. <coughs> yeah? So there's no ignorance there. And so what you might observe is there are these operators in this, these quantifiers in these sentences that actually get rid of the ignorance. So this is a very simple uh, uh, sentence, right, with, with not much going on in it. Here suddenly we have this quantifier, and we have a plural. Here, nothing special going on. Here we have a modal. Yeah? Uh, a modal is also a quantifier. So, um, um, so the descriptive generalization that um, comes out of this is the following. Modified numerals of uh, the modifiers, like at least, need to be associated to a range of values. And this will account for the observations that we've made. And this works as follows. So if I say I have at least two children, um, then there's a range here, and that's an epistemic range. Yeah? So I, I'm undecided about how many children I have, but I have a range in my head. So within the possibilities that I'm still entertaining, two is the lowest. Yeah? Um, so in this sentence, that's the kind of range that we have. If you have a quantifier, like all laptops have at least two gigabytes of memory, it's actually the quantifier that gives you the range, right? So what happens is you simply line up all the laptops, you look at all the different kinds of, uh, different amounts of uh, memory that these laptops have, and then you conclude that the lowest is two gigabytes, but there's other stuff as well. Yeah, so there the range is really due to a range of laptops. Um, you must get at least 120 ECTS. Uh, here you have a deontic range. So here you've got a deontic modal must, and that deontic modal will give you all the options. So the lowest possible option is 120, but there are also other options. So if you get 122 credits, that's also fine, and you also pass. But if you get 119, that's not good enough. Yeah? So here the range is deontic in nature. Uh, so here's the triangle example again. <coughs> a triangle has at most nine sides. It's strange. Why is it? So ignore the star. I don't know what they says is star, but it should have, I don't know what it should have, a question mark or a hashtag or whatever. It's, it's somehow unacceptable. Um, um, 
So why is this? Well, because we can't really think of a range that would make sense. If we try the epistemic range, that's a bit weird because you would accept the speaker to uh, you would expect the speaker to know how, how many sides a triangle has. And also, we can't really think of a, of a range of different kind of triangles with different numbers of sides because we know that these kinds of figures have a fixed number of sides. So here's the example that does work. Um, so the base of a pyramid has at least three sides, right? So because the base of a pyramid can be a triangle, it can be a square, it can be a whatever, right? As long as it's not uh, um, a line, because then you have a triangle and not a pyramid. Okay, mm -hmm. right? So here we have a range. We can s we can put all the, the kinds of pyramids next to each other, and then the pyramid with the simplest base will be s uh, with a base of three, right? And next to it will be a base of four and a base of five. So that will be our range now. Um, okay, so here's the conclusion uh, about this. This is this descriptive uh, generalization. At least needs to be associated to a range of values, and more than lacks this requirement. Yeah. So this is our. This is the semantics now. Yeah. So I haven't uh, not under the hood, but this is what captures the data. Yeah. A range for things like at least, and no range for things like more than. Um, now we have something to grab, grasp hold of, right? So now we can look at these, go back at all these different kinds of modified numerals and test whether they, they are, whether they are of the range kind or of the non-range kind. And so let's just give them labels. So modified numerals that do not have the requirement are called class A. So those are things like more than. And modified numerals with, uh, with the requirement, so with these range effects, we call class B. And then English looks like this. Uh, so we have the comparative here, uh, the superlative here. Uh, we've got the locative uh, prepositions here. We've got the directional prepositions here. Um, we've got disjunction here, and we've got these adverbs here. Uh, this one here between is a difficult one. Uh, um, I, I'm not actually not sure whether this belongs here. So that's a, that's that's some. That's up for grabs. Um, here's, the, here's the Dutch table. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't speak Dutch, this is an exact copy of the English table, right? which maybe isn't that big of a su surprise. But um, what, is this, what might be a surprise is that it's so neat. right? So it's, again, the, the forms that you encounter are comparative, locative, superlative, directional, disjunction. Um, and in several other languages that we tried, we see exactly the same thing in Italian. I'll give you one other example in Japanese. D did you do this, Yasuo? Can you remember? I don't know who to blame for this. Um, but um, what is interesting here and uh, um, is that this isn't so. This 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 superlative here looks different from the superlative in. Uh, in English, right? I, I'm right, right? This isn't. Re there's no real superlative morphology here. There's a sort of dedicated uh, uh, superlative. I don't know what to call it, even quantifier, I suppose. Um, so what you see really is that whatever a language uses to talk about this superlative possibility or to talk about the comparison, that's what's going to end up in this contrast. And that is going to give you the contrast that, you, that I talked about in English. So the hypothesis is really that this is something that is quite stable. Uh, we, we haven't tested this. I mean, we've tested this maybe on, on 10, 15 languages, but nothing deep. Um, so the hypothesis is that class A will always look like comparatives and locative prepositions, and class B will look like superlatives, directional prepositions, uh, disjunctions, and adverbs of minimality and maximality. Um, what we did test was the directional prepositions. So we had, uh, well, I had a student look at this, and uh, she, she took a random sample of 13 languages. And it was very easy. You, you just ask people, how do you say uh, drive up to the church or something like that? OK, now take that, that preposition. Can you stick that in front of a, uh, of, a, of a number word? And then if yes, OK, then 
uh, try this sentence with a triangle? Do you find it acceptable? And, and you know, and, and and compare it to something else. And it it was really uh, seamless. It was every every interview went exactly the same way. People just found this very easy to find these expressions, to show that they're directional, uh, <coughs> and to show that they have these effects, these range effects. Um, so what could account for this, right? So why do we see superlatives, directionals have these range requirements and disjunctions have these range requirements and comparatives and locatives don't have this. Um, so here's my stab at this. These class B expressions are expressions that for whatever reason, so that reason might be uh, different for every item that you look at, um, they have a range requirement, right? So the range requirement is really lexical, but it might be for a different, it might have a different, it might look different for each of these items. So another way of saying that, these are expressions that resist singular values or specific values. So they're anti-specifics, and in, in, in to use some terminology that you see other way. Um, <coughs> So what it means then is if it has this requirement in its original domain, as soon as you transpose the meaning onto the numerical domain, that requirement will still be in place. And that will give you the effects that we've seen. So I'm now going to very quickly show you how that would work with superlatives, directional prepositions, and disjunction. So this is to show you that when we use a superlative, not in the numerical domain, but in its original adjectival domain, it also has things like a range requirement. It just looks a little bit different. Uh, so have a look at the first sentence. The tallest queen of the Netherlands is called Maxima. Uh, this is a strange sentence uh, because we only have one queen. And she's not just the tallest queen. She's also the shortest queen. Right? She's the only queen. Right? So this is very strange. Why would you call her the tallest queen? Um, so what this means is that we can't use a, uh, an adjective in superlative form to talk about things that, uh, that are only one. Right? So you need a range of things, and then you need to pick out the tallest. Similarly, the ma so this also goes for uh, like these superlative uh, adverbs, like maxim or adjectives like maximum. The maximum number of wheels on my car is four. That's, that's just ridiculous, right? Why did you not just say that the number of wheels on your car is four? Why stick in that maximum, right? There's just one number here, and that's four. So you, you, can't really, you can't really compare a single number to a maximum or a minimum. A minimum or a maximum is something that you apply to a set, a range of numbers, not to a number by itself. That, that's what goes wrong here. So you can save these kinds of sentences. So the tallest queen the Netherlands ever had is called Beatrix, right? So where you now start talking about a range of queens, right? And then you pick the tallest one, that's fine. Or the maximum number of wheels I can fit on the back seat is four. Yeah? So where again, you talk about a, a range of modal possibilities. Yeah? And so here you see immediately that a modal can actually introduce this, right? So we saw that before too. This mod these modals can introduce ranges. And that's exactly what happened. I gave a talk similar to this in Belgium once, and people didn't understand this first sentence because everybody thought it was fine. And that's because in Belgium, when a king dies or abdicates and the queen uh, remains alive, she remains queen. So Belgium right now has three queens, which is something I didn't know. So in, in Belgium, so the, the, the shortest queen of Belgium is called Fabiola. It's probably a true sentence, and it's a felicitous sentence, because Belgium has three queens. And my guess is Fabiola is the shortest one, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, Let's get this in the interest of time. Um, so that what this shows, what, so what I think this shows is that so in its original domain, superlatives already have this range requirement, right? And so the only thing that we, that we then need to assume is that this range requirement also holds in the numerical d domain. And that gives you the effects that we saw. Um, now let's see, path expressions do uh, something similar. <coughs> so there are two kinds of path expressions. You have path expressions of space and path expressions of time. And most languages use the same preposition to talk about both. English is actually strange because it distinguishes up to and until. 
so these things are not compatible with something that is uh, not directional. Yeah. Uh, so Jasper is standing up to the goal line is strange, or Jasper arrived until 10 p.m. is also strange. So you've got this something punctual, and you use something path-like, uh, right, interval-like to talk about that. That's that's not fine. Um, so what you get is something like this. Um, so wh what saves it is if you have something like sleep. Jasper slept until 9 a.m. That's fine, and that's because sleeping has a has you know sleeping is a, a, a number of consecutive uh, points in time that you're talking about. Um, and this seems to be the so this is also what you see in the literature. So the requirement really um, uh, for something like until is that the Jasper verb bit holds for an interval i, and it also holds at each subinterval of i. Yeah. So it's it's somehow so you, this doesn't work for arrive, right? Because arrive is punctual, and you can't carve it up into multiple arrive bits. Uh, but with sleeping, you, you can do that, and that's why it's felicitous. Um, so we, we sometimes call this homogeneity. But it should be clear that, in principle, this is, again, a kind of range requirement, right? Or at least a range requirement is at the basis of this, right? So in order to use something like until, you really have to have a range of things. Yeah, and and there's, there, there might be some additional things that you also need, right? So like this homogeneity, but you, you, to start with, you need to have some kind of structure. Um, and in an interesting paper by uh, 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 Chris Pignon, he shows that this, this, this thinking in, in, in temporal semantics about until, you can actually, uh, you can actually uh, 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 show that in the in the in the spatial uh, semantics you see similar things. So you you might think of something like spatial homogeneity. Um, so you can't say things like he relocated up to Amsterdam. Right. So the the only way you can interpret this is with it, where where up to are two uh, prepositions, and where up is basically the the direction. So he he was so say the Hague is south of Amsterdam. So and so Amsterdam is upwards from The Hague. And so he moved, he relocated up, upwards, to Amsterdam. But that's not so. In, in Dutch, this is easier because you don't have this. So you just have this, this, this simple preposition, tot, which means up to. Um, the sign points up to the auditorium. So think of a sign that points like this, right? So that that you so if a sign points like this, it might be fine. But uh, if the sign simply points to the uh, auditorium, that seems to be really bad, right? Or I crossed up to the north side of the pass. Th that also seems to be bad. And the requirement really seems to be again that you have homogeneity. But what goes wrong here is that these things like crossing, and relocating, and pointing. They aren't homogeneous, right? Because if you relocate from The Hague to Amsterdam, then you're not also relocating to all the towns in between, right? You're, you're basically taking one point and you're going to the next point. And if I point to the auditorium, I'm not pointing to the tree that's in the way, right? I'm, I'm, I'm really pointing you towards that, that single thing. And the same with crossing, right? So you, cr you don't cross to the halfway point. You only cross to the final point. Um, finally, here's another range requirement uh, that we see, and that's the range requirement of disjunction. Um, the, the, the typos, uh, I, was, I was getting tired here, I think, uh, maybe you too. But the dis, the, oh no, this, this actually makes sense. The disjuncts of a disjunction have to be part of a range. OK, no, that, that does make sense. Um, so it, there's a lot of work in uh, about disjunction, um, and especially about the effects that are described here. But they're never really described in any sense as a range requirement. But the goal of this slide is to show you that, and, and basically, this is the same kind of thing. It might be a different mechanism that is at the at the, at the heart of it, but still, the effect is that there is a range. So uh, again, so let's take this first example: John ate an apple or a pear. The normal way to interpret this is that the speaker doesn't know what John ate. Yeah. Um, so here again, there's an epistemic range, and this epistemic range reflects the disjuncts. Yeah. So the disjuncts f form a range, and that, that range respects something epistemic. 
Um, similarly, and this is the free choice effect of this junction, uh, John may eat an apple or a pear. What that means is that uh, John has the permission of eating a pear and he has the permission of eating an apple. Yeah? Um, and here again, what we have is a deontic range. Yeah? So the disjuncts now fall in what is deontically possible. Uh, similarly, with the universal quantifier, everybody ate an apple or a pear. Um, that could mean that uh, you line everybody up and you simply uh, write down what they ate, and then you get a list of things, and that range is going to be this and this. Yeah. So again, you have some sort of uh, range here, and that range that then reflects the quantification here. Uh, by the way, this one, and actually this one too, you could also read with an epistemic range, right? So if I ask you, what did everybody eat, right? So everybody ate the same thing, but I forgot what it is, right? And you say, oh, yeah, everybody ate an apple or a pear, but I forgot which one. Yeah. And um, similar here, uh, the speaker may be giving permission to eat something, but he forgot what it is that people actually have permission to have, right? So it, w all, what this shows you is as long as there is some kind of range, then uh, the sentence is felicitous. Um, okay. Uh, but for instance, if you, um, if you know that John ate an apple and he didn't eat a pear, then this sentence is infelicitous. Uh, and uh, similarly, if you know that John is allowed to eat an, eat an apple, but he's not allowed to eat a pear, then this sentence is also uh, not acceptable. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's the conclusion. Um, put simply, uh, something like up to 10 doesn't correspond to something like this. And at least 10 doesn't correspond to something like that. Um, so the the semantics and pragmatics of these things are completely non-trivial. And that's because the forms that we use to, uh, um, to form these modified numerals carry a lot of baggage. Right? They carry certain requirements that they have in the original domain, uh, and those requirements still hold in the numerical domain. Um, so this is at this point. So the semantic profile of these things really applies across domains. Yeah. Uh, and so it, the, the reason why you see this, especially in the domain of quantity, is because the domain of quantity is, is nice and easy to mold. right? So we have this metaphor that we can use, but also it's scalar. So whenever we have something like, uh, like space, which is also scalar, right, which also works with orderings and stuff like that, we can easily transpose it to quantity. Um, there's one other thing that I haven't talked about, and that is that uh, th this is sort of something I'm, I'm quite enthusiastic about always. A decompositional analysis pays off. Um, so it's, uh, when you do semantics, you shouldn't look at at least 10 and then, and then just look. Um, trigger implicates to the same extent, to the same strength, if you want. Um, and what we found is that um, um, th this is a superlative uh, modified numeral. Uh, implicatures are very good. People, people do them a lot. Um, and the comparative modified numerals are significantly, uh, they, they appear significantly less often, and people find them uh, less good. Uh, but they're not bad. I, so I, I, I can't explain you the whole uh, experiment, but you see so that this is a significant difference, but um, what you would actually expect maybe is that this is all the way at the bottom. So what we found is that actually um, um, comparative modified numerals behave almost the same as superlative modified numerals with respect to uh, the scalar of temperatures. Now, that is, um, so this is actually in a sense, uh, um, uh, not a very surprising uh, finding, um, but um, the, the next step would really be now to look at these free choice style uh, inferences, um, and for instance, the, the ignorance inferences, to see whether there the, the effects are much uh, greater. Um, um, now, one reason why this is interesting is because uh, some free choice 
I mean, there are theories of free choice implicatures that basically almost reduce that, that couch them in the mechanisms that are used for scalar implicatures, right? So the, the, it, this, this, you can use this domain as a vehicle to study different kinds of implicatures. Actually, that, that, was, that was my answer. <laughs> yes. So you showed us that the superlative requires a range with the Dutch coin example. Yeah. Right. Uh, but the comparative counterpart of the sentence is as weird as this. But you want to say that the comparative doesn't require a range. Is that correct? Um, so, what, what, so in what sense is, does comparative not require a range? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a good, very good question. Um, you, you can't compare them here, because the comparative uh, compares things. <laughs> so you need something to compare it to. Does that mean that comparatives require a certain kind of range? Uh, they need two values, um, but the second value doesn't need to be part of a range. But, um, but yeah. so he, here you also compare, so it, this is really sort of entrenched in the semantics of these things, right? So here you're also comparing the, uh, the height of the queen to the height of others, right? Yeah, uh, but the question is now, what are these others, uh, right? And, and so here you really need a range of things. That, so that, that's the, so if you look at these kind of, where have I got a good example? Right, so here um, we've, we've got two numbers. We've got the, the number of ch children and we've got the number one. And that's what you're comparing. So, and that's enough for the, for the comparative to have two values. Um, for the superlative, that's not enough. Right? You really need to assume that there is, um, that there, that there is, that the thing you're comparing this to to is itself a range. So what you what you might so what you might actually end up saying is that this example that I have with the queen. So you might be right that this can't tell me anything because I can't give you a similar example with the comparative that would be fine here. Right. Um, but I kind of feel tricked here because. The height of the queen is fixed in this case, right? And in the child example, yeah. If the carries, if this carries over to the child example, yeah. The number of the kids I have is fixed, and the range should be in the number, uh, right? Rather than in the in the number of children I have, no. The height of the queen is like the number in the, in the modified numeral. Oh, that's the number? Yeah. So that, that's not something that's... Oh, okay. Do you see what I mean? And so, and you're comparing to that to a state of affairs. Oh, and, and, and that would be, say, um, a range of queens and their heights. Right. Right, that's the, the comparison class in your... Uh -huh. in your semantics of the superlative. Right. But I, I really have to think hard about, uh, so your challenge is now, give me a comparative sentence that I could stick next to this that would show that this behaves differently. But that might, you, you might be right that this is quite hard because the comparative compares things. True. And, uh, uh, Yeah, so, the idea, so I have to think about this. The only thing I can say is that, of course, there is no, there's no simple way of, of changing, of, of comparing this immediately to the, to the 
numeral domain. Because in the numeral domain, one of the things is really, both, of, both the number and the thing you're comparing it to are really given in the sentence. Right? Where here, the comparison class is, is sort of implicit. Right? It's not something that There's also a uniqueness difference. Queens are unique, whereas children are unique. Yeah. Right, but that's... Except for <laughs> exactly, yeah. No, but so I think what Yasser's point is, what if I have the taller queen of the Netherlands? Right. It's called Maxima. Yes, it can only have to be one. Yeah, but, but, but the comparison doesn't have a range requirement, so why, can, why is that? Why can't we? Because you need to have the comparison, but it can't be. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but, that's, yeah. but then I don't have my minimal pair. Right. Ask you a different yeah. question. From a topological perspective, it will be interesting to know to what extent what you're talking about is is extensible to other languages. The, um, the study that you mentioned, yeah. all of the languages there were either Indo-European or spoken in the European area, and it would be neat to like, go to West Africa or Southeast Asia and see if you can replicate. Yeah, that's that, yeah, absolutely. That would be that would be very nice. Um, and you could also think about so what happens if you don't really have uh, uh, the kind of comparative, comparative topology that English has. Uh, preposition systems might be uh, slightly different in uh, interesting ways. Uh, yeah, that's definitely something we want to do. I'm, I'm, I'm on a European grant and it's very hard for us to go through uh, and, uh, and um, so on. Um, I need sort of the remote Africans living in I know, but so so I really need to find my I need so I need help finding uh, finding good important skills. So if you have suggestions, uh, uh, where to look. We'll take any bus in London. <laughs> <laughs> I actually yeah, so I had a colleague who did this and uh, he just he just spoke to random people in the street and said, Where are you from? I'm also curious, there's lots of isomorphism between temporal and spatial domains. Yeah. You're saying that they're actually very different here, in the sense that you don't get the temporal. You don't get it in English, but you get it in almost every domain. Okay. Yeah. No, so they're not different. So <coughs> they're not different. Um, it's just English is weird. English has this thing until, which is very strange. Uh, um, and I, so I do, yeah, but, but almost, I think all the languages that we looked at, uh, uh, so they are like, we can do the same in temporal. Actually, the temporal domain is interesting because uh, there, maybe the uh, metaphors might be slightly different. So you can, you can um, bring it. Bring a meeting forward, uh, right, which is uh, is not in any sense vertical, right? So there, the the spatial, the sort of spatial metaphors for time are different from the spatial metaphors for. Time. So that that brings in a, a, an extra complexity. I, I haven't really looked at those kinds of things. So most of the uh, when when people uh, tell me about counter examples of verticality, they usually shift to temporal uses of modified uh, tools. Good. Um, at, the, at the beginning of the talk, um, you said that it's problematic or that <coughs> maybe a challenge still for formal semanticists to talk about this metaphor of the transfer from wherever it's from, from the location space to temporal space. To this. So, so in, in your analysis, how do you present the propositions? Is, is there a way that, that the parallelism comes out, or are you just assuming it's a constant and that's what it is? Um, so the, the, the honest answer is that um, this metaphorical story sort of accounts for why you, you can use one meaning in a different domain. But what most formal semanticists will then do is they still give you two different meanings, one that can apply to numbers and one that can apply to spaces, 
and then they just point out that if you look at them from a metaphorical point of view, they're actually the same meaning. Uh, so, uh, it, so, so what I what I tried pointing out is that it's just not something we do in formal semantics, and maybe we should do it, but uh, uh, we don't. So we, we we simply think that. So it, so the semantics of uh, up to in the numerical domain. If, if I were to write it down for my students, I would simply still use uh, a, a comparison uh, symbol to compare numbers. Uh, but the understanding is that uh, at the heart of this is is something that's uh, that is spatial. Uh, but but, we, but why should we use vector space semantics to talk about the relation between two numbers? If, if we can very simply write it down as B is, is greater than 2. Right? So it, it, it also has to do with a, a level of complexity. Mm. So I, I suppose this is, this is how it goes. If we wanted to, we could use the semantics, our, our spatial semantics, to talk about these things. But in reality, it would be easier just to <coughs> stick with our, uh, with our numerical relations that we know. Um, uh, in the understanding that this has come about via this metaphorical bridge. But it would be interesting to see if anything happens if we really apply the, the full spatial semantics of these things to... Uh, uh, I mean, because spatial semantics isn't just orientation and direction, there's, there's often a lot more going on than the perspective. So they don't have you know what do you use to be a comparative there, so what 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 do they know? I mean don't have mathematical operators like two plus two equals four right? Okay, but that's yeah, but nothing nothing in this needs that I suppose. I mean we need it to write things down, but uh, you know, write our semantics down. But I don't think you need any math language in you know, order to uh, do this, as long as you have something that looks like a comparative. It doesn't have to be comparative, but that does the job of the comparative. Yeah. Uh, I, I would think, but I. Uh, yeah. Could you go back to the side of the uh, barrel head? These two are so low. With the last one, Beryl had at least three shares. I, I can't understand how to respond to that one. Mm -hmm. you, you don't understand why, why you would say, so you would say yes to this? I, I, yeah, and I can't understand this. the interpretation of She didn't have at least three, she had exactly Yeah, so, so my... So this one, this room will really split in half. Some people will find it completely obvious that this is yes, and the other half will say no. Um, so, but it, there might be. So, why is why this split actually? Because if you look at the proposal, this should be uh, uh, zero percent, um, right? So actually, so uh, so from from my proposal of semantics, I I would be able to account for why you have this intuition because your intuition according to my semantics should be this says that she um, she might have had four sharings um, but the premise says she didn't right? and so, so, it? Uh, we, we, yeah, so we changed this later to exactly three sharings and the results are exactly the same yeah so <laughs> yeah so that we thought so we thought that this was because Beryl had three sharings may be read uh, sort of in a very weak way, so three or more, right? Uh, so we then changed it, and we, we changed it into barrel had exactly three sherries, and I think the percentages went down a little bit, but 
nowhere near zero. Um, but don't you think it might be that people were unclear as to whether they are asking a question, is it true as opposed to I will say it? So for me, it's sure. just semantics practice. <coughs> and actually, I, I, you know, the 92%, I, I think I would be with the eight in the yeah. sense that, well, you know, she had fewer than four, but not really fewer than five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, you get an inflation. Uh, yeah, these, are, these are supposed uh, 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 not to exist, but, uh, but that's fine. Um, I, I, I completely buy that, and you might be completely right. The only thing we used this for back then, and I would like to use it now uh, too, is that there is a clear contrast between these responses and these responses. So, uh, so the conclusion is we have to do something, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what that is, yeah, this, this could be very much a, a, a pragmatic thing. Yeah. So, so that's why this could be chance level, not because people think that this is false, but because you are. Sure, she had at least three sherries, but I would never say that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you would get uh, half. <laughs> half of them going either, either way, right? But um, this has been replicated many times, by the way, with different um, different variations. Here is a paper by uh, Napoleon Consos and Chris Cummins where they try to do this a little bit more professionally. Um, um, and they show that, um, I can't remember how they did it, they really show that this is a pragmatic effect. And so they use uh, acceptance scales, and they train, I think they train, I might be telling a lie here, I think they train people to use the middle value for things that are uh, pragmatically odd, mm -hmm. and to use the bottom value for things that are false. Um, don't ask me how do you train people to do that. Uh, but what they see is that people with these kind of things, they go for the middle value. Suggest we actually carry on an experiment with Rick had three sherries um, <laughs> to the bar. So, um, so uh, join me in thanking Rick for a very interesting talk.